So you can go and buy the asset and you can see the potential to take it to another level and you know, however you put that together. That's why real estate is one of the best investments and it's, you know, known to man, beginning of time, is one of the areas that people really, truly create generational wealth. And you can do it. I mean, even if you're just making, you know, under $100,000 a year, it's, you got to have the vision. You got to bring something to the table. You go out and you collect like minds or investors and just start buying it. If it's as simple as just doing what I did with the houses, you know, with my wife and I just on the side. Welcome to Seven Figure Entrepreneur Podcast, the number one podcast bringing you behind the scenes with real online earners. No fake gurus here. And today we have the wonderful Daryl Betts. This is going to be a little bit of a different one. He is a real estate expert. Tyler knows him well. I just met him. Seems like a fantastic gentleman. Uh, so I'm excited to see where this goes. So uh, yeah, Tyler, you know what? I'm just going to let you sort of lead this one off because like I'm not a big real estate guy. Uh, I <laughs> hope to be one day, but you are. So let's go from there, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. So just to give everyone some background, uh, the way I actually got in touch with Daryl Betts is through Manny Koshman. I know a lot of people that watch this also know Manny. He's the guy with all the Bugatti. He's got like 30 million in cars. And the reason I uh, met Daryl through Manny is because I took Daryl or Manny's uh, private coaching, uh, which was an awesome experience. Definitely learned a ton. And probably the greatest resource I took away from that was meeting Daryl. Um, what's awesome about Daryl and I'll let him talk about his background because he's done some epic shit. And like, obviously this podcast is going to be a little different than most. Like usually we talk about online businesses, but like once you started making money, like it doesn't really do you a whole lot of good putting in the bank. So once you've got enough where you started to amass it, like you got to figure out how to, obviously to invest it. I've looked at a, a lot of different stuff when it comes to investment and the best investments I've ever made have been in real estate. So if when my business no longer needs my cash, I try to plow as much as I can into real estate. And so you really want to learn from people who've obviously been there, done that. And uh, so that's how we took the coaching from Manny. But uh, anyway, so we we're at Manny's event and Daryl was one of the speakers. Um, you and Manny have done how much deals together? 300, 400 million plus. So they've done a crap ton of real estate. And even that's kind of a drop in the bucket of maybe actually, if you don't mind, uh, give everyone who's listening or watching today a brief overview of uh, what you've done in your real estate career. Yeah, absolutely. And and thanks, TD, and thanks, Gabriel. Um, no so, yeah, my name's Daryl Betts. Uh, I'm with Avis & Young. We're a Canadian-based uh, commercial real estate company worldwide throughout the world. Uh, I've been doing this all my life. I'm 57 years old. Uh, went to uh, Texas A&M University, graduated with a finance degree. I grew up in Houston, Texas, and prior to that, uh, different spots. And I lived in Taiwan when I was a kid, when my father was in the uh, in the Air Force. And so um, I've always, always, always wanted to, when I was a kid, my, I, I never forget, my dad was in, in, in the Air Force and he's walking down the hall and, I, and in his flying outfit and this big, giant, giant man, and I'm about 10 years old. I'm like, is hey, Dan, what should I do with my life? Well, you know, what, what should I, you know, what should I start to study? And he said, if you if you understand numbers and you understand finance, you can do anything. And so that was really the beginning of me wanting to get a degree in finance and get an emphasis in real estate. And I got into real estate back in 1987, where everything was wow. being closed on and and probably just you know massive distress out in the marketplace. So I uh, I went to go work for started off working for a a, a, a bank and, and doing bad loans and working through bad loans and and then worked for a developer and then worked my way into the brokerage side of the business and then elevated through over the years through through several different companies worldwide. I traveled the world. I have clients all around the world. Uh, we've done $10 billion plus in deals. At any given time, we have 300 to 500 million on the market. Um, right now we have in the queue that we're under contract or are looking to monetize another billion and a half to two billion. And it's been really blessed that we've taken it to the level we've done. Um, we sold over 245 office buildings over the last 20 plus years. We've done a lot of high-end uh, land sales. We've done high-end retail. Uh, we've done a lot of big box uh, uh, warehouses. And then recently, 
Um, we get very involved in infrastructure assets and infrastructure assets or assets that have heavy uh, uh, dollars into like rail or deep water board or a big logistical center on uh, every refinery, a power plant. And I've just, you, you, you kind of reach a, 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 a momentum in your career and in your life and that you can bring all your experiences together. Then I have a you're saying is this deals beget deals. And so the key is, is, is making the relationships I made with Tyler, who I call now TD and some of his uh, partners and, and, and starting with Gabriel and what he, Gabriel's doing. And so it's amazing. I've, I've been taught to think as the entire world is really your background. And, and, and as we see different things occurring and it's occurred over time and where we are today, and it's really easy to be negative or positive or uh, concerned. And the key is to sit back and observe what's going on and, and try to get ahead of it and use that as a, as a way to, to protect yourself, your family, your finances, uh, depending on if, if, you know, if you're looking to, how do I start moving out of my, my job? I'm making a hundred thousand dollars a year. And how do I go make $10 million a year? Or how do I protect my extra hundred million in an asset that's deflating in value? I also have a, a great team here at Amos & Young, seven people on my team. So at any given time, no matter where I am, um, I've always got somebody working to send something out or follow up or explain some of the rent rules or the issues. And so you just can't do it as one person. To get <laughs> with technology, you can enhance yourself and your footprint. But what I love is I really think globally. Early on in my career, when I was being recruited to these different companies, they would say, okay, we want you to work in Houston, Texas, Northwest Houston. I'm like, I want to work all of Texas or I want to work, you know, South of you know, the Southern part of the United States. And then it was, you know, I want to go over to Dubai. And then I, since then I've been over there five times with the mayor of Houston and dignitaries and with technology and the ability to communicate and interact with people, the, the world is, is really your, 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 your playground. And so what I love about traveling internationally, I don't sleep much, is you can be working a day in Dubai and still not miss your work day in, in the States because you can work the other side of the, the 12 hours. You just don't get much sleep. But um, going back to the, the wisdom my, my father taught me, uh, he, who, um, who passed when I was young, uh, he, he was 57. He was around a lot of top secret military installations. He was a big pilot. And, and so he taught me a lot of the things I attribute my success to uh, today. So uh, I, I mentioned him a lot in the, in the values and the, and the vision he, 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 uh, he instilled in me along with my mother. So I'm very blessed to have that. But so much of it is true because if you understand numbers and you can, you can explain numbers. Um, when people want to come work for us and, and they want to get my business, and the first thing I'm going to say is, is you know, what is your background? Do you know numbers? Do you understand finance? Do you, do you understand the time value of money? If you cannot explain to somebody why something is valuable, you're done. Because you can be, you know, prolific speaker out there. But if, if they know you're dancing around, then why should I do this? You're done. And then if you can go toe to toe with billionaires and institutions and worldwide companies, in front of, you know, 10 people at a boardroom and, and, and they say, Daryl, we think you're, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And we, we think you're full of, you know what? And I say, oh, I disagree. It's just why you need to do this and boom, 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 boom. And they do that to test you because if you immediately start to retreat, then they know you're weak and you're not going to go represent them. But if you go back at them and uh, get me out know, and respectfully and say, no, no, that's not right. I'll never forget, I was on a, on a plane, the very wealthy uh, gentleman from uh, Mexico City, he did a bunch of car dealerships in, in, in Texas, and we're on a Gulfstream, uh, I think it was a 450, and we're listening to Frank Sinatra, drinking scotch, the sun was, was, uh, was going down, his wife is in the back of the jet, and we're up in the front, and he said, well, let's talk about this deal, and we're going into Teterboro, which I don't know if anybody, I'm sure you guys, some of you guys know what Teterboro is, it's, it's the holy grail of private jets. In the United States. So it's just um, it's just on the other side of New York City. It's in, in New Jersey. So when you land, it's just a playground in private jets. And so we're going to Teterboro and it's going in and out, in and out because of the the, uh, the descent into Teterboro, you have to go through all these different uh, routes. And, and so it was back when the, 
the World Trade Centers and all the Twin Towers were there, and, and it was great memory. But we're sitting there going, you know, going in Teterboro, and we're talking about this deal. And I said, Daryl, why should I do this deal? I said, well, let's, let's get the numbers out. Let's get the numbers, you know, just that. He said, well, just tell me why I should do it. And so if you, you can't get to a point where you can explain, no matter how complicated a deal is, to somebody, they call, you, know, you can call it the elevator speech. You can just say, give me the highlights. Then you can't be effective in this business. You got to be, be, be able to back it up with the spreadsheets and uh, get a full-time analyst that's on our team, full-time marketing person, another full-time assist, uh, the broker that assists me, assists me. So you have to have a, a combination of all these talents, but you know, you got to back it up with the spreadsheets and the analysis and things like that. But if you can't summarize numbers, why you should invest in bonds, stocks, real estate, cars, houses, you know, you pick your, your opportunity, then you can't properly gauge what kind of returns you can make. And then on top of that, you can dig in and talk about inflation and how inflation is eroding your buy buying power, where we are today with interest rates. Going back to when I originally started, you know, it was in a very trying time back in the late 80s and interest rates were 10, 12%. When I was growing up um, in junior high in a Carter administration, our rates were 20, 22%. So my okay. wife and I buy, buy our first house in 1995 and um, our first interest rate was 12%. And I thought we were killing it. Because yeah. it Isn't that funny, the perception, man? I feel like we've been spoiled for so long. Oh, absolutely. And so then when it got down to 10, I'm like, oh, this is great. Let me refinance. So I kept refinancing. And early on, and this is going back to just kind of a sidebar with real estate. One of the things my wife and I did, and I'm very blessed and, and a beautiful red, redhead, hot smoking wife and, and two beautiful daughters that just graduated from the University of Texas. And uh, But when we started buying houses, we would buy houses, turn around, flip them, fix them up, go to the next one. And uh, if I didn't have a, a crew of workers, you know, coming every day in the house, fixing things up, I felt like we weren't making money. And if you can, you can buy real estate on a single family or in multifamily, and that's a great way to start off is just go in, buy a house, live in it, get a very trusting contractor, pay him cash if you can and enhance value, turn around, sell it in a year, double your money, double your money, double your money. So we did that. Five or six times, I took a hundred thousand and made like two and a half million from doubling your value of our homes over over my kids' childhood up until they went to college. And so during that time period, you know, I'm, I'm doing new loans and and I came from an era where interest rates were always high. So I thought they were always was no no they're going to go back up, but they're going to go back up. So I always lock into a long term deal, right? The thirty year fixed. And, and then everybody started to, started to let their loans adjust on a variable rate. And it took me half of that 15 years to get comfortable with going to a 2.5% interest rate versus being secured at a 5. Because it was just, I had seen what high interest rates would do. And so we've had about, I mean, both of you guys probably been in a low interest rate environment for most of your professional career, or at least 50% mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, um, so comparatively to what you know, you guys dealt with absolutely. Yeah, so you say '87, you graduated. I was born in '85, so yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, uh, and I, I feel like you're like my younger brother, but not that young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so you know, we've had low interest rates, and and I've been saying forever, we've had 15 years of low rates, and I forget one of the things my dad said. He said if you could pay, if you could figure out which way interest rates are going you can make as much money as you dream of. You can just sit on a beach and make bets. And yeah. it's really, it's really the, it, it, and that's simple, right? And so so you look back over the last 15 years and rates kept going down and down and down. And and, I, and when I would go to these presentations and we would talk and I would talk with these uh, leaders of companies and very high net worth individuals and they're like, well, what do you think rates are going to do? And, and I'm a believer in just going for it and saying what she thinks is going to happen. And not to just sit on the fence and kind of hedge your your bet. And, and I mean, be bold, make a statement. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. But you know, stand by your statement because that's what people expect from advisors and and people they trust is not to just hedge your bets and and, and not really deliver a message. You know, just go for it, deliver a message. So 
I would say when we get off of this crack, we're going to be in trouble because when high interest rates come back, it's going to double, triple, quadruple the cost of everything in paying it. So what's ha what happened over the 15 years is it, it really protected a lot of people from losing their assets. And it also gave the chance of manufacturers as inflation rose, um, you had cheaper cost of debt. So things get more expensive, but it didn't go that up too much because rents were back there, rental rates went high and interest rates went down. So I'll go back to my first Suburban I bought. I had like a $200 note and it was a $40,000 Suburban, which at the time was a lot of money for a Suburban. You know, yeah. those are $80,000, $100,000. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, take your take your nicest, uh, you know, Range Rover. You used to get into the, the top Big Daddy Range Ro Rover for a hundred. Now it's ten fifty. And so as as your cost in debt starts going up, now we've had fifteen years of run up of those those those, those um, vehicles or those assets. Well, you're a good old boy driving a hundred thousand dollar F one fifty four wheel drive, and you know your payments were eleven hundred. And a two and a half percent interest rate. Now they're freaking twenty five hundred dollars, three thousand. Yeah, and that's what's happening to us right now. And most people don't understand that because they really don't put into context what high interest rates do and the cost of debt. So mm -hmm. we're on the doorstep of a very different time period. I give it uh, similar to what they call it the last the lost decade. When I was just coming out of college, maybe 85 to 95, not, you know, 88 to 98, where you just, where just nothing was, the economy was just slowly kind of churning along and, and, you know, and, and interest rates were not going down yet. And we, you know, we started to have a lot of foreclosures. My first job at a, at a college was working with the Wells Fargo, which uh, at the time, I forget the, uh, the name of it, first interstate, um, and it was taken over by Wells Fargo. And and I would go and and uh, foreclose on the court, uh, courthouse steps and meet with these very wealthy, well-known borrowers and and try to do workouts with them. And I was 21, 22, and I was very respectful because the risk they took. I didn't want to be arrogant and felt like I had power over them. I, I, I was more how do I learn from these guys and what yeah. they're being. Your back's up against the wall. And so, what do you think will happen? And sorry to cut you off, but like because by yeah, my mind, it's like. If this is all happening, in great distress, there's always great opportunity. I make, we make more money during turbulence. And I think that's where the great powers and leaders and success stories in the world occur in turbulent times. Mm -hmm. So you never want to have ill will against, um, you know, just the common, the common neighbor that they don't, they're not doing well. I mean, just because you do well and they don't doesn't mean they, you know, you should, it, it's not a limited pie. Everybody can flourish. And so it, it, it hurts to see what's going to happen to a lot of just fixed income employees. And, mm -hmm. uh, but if you could think outside the box and you can get creative, this is one of the most creative times to break out and start new companies and new, new, new ways to make money. If you're not evolving, you're slowly dying. I think you, you've, you've got to embrace that and embrace the environment you're in and learn how to take advantage of it. And yeah. we talk about a little bit in this podcast about green energy and how less than year one year I've turned from not really understanding green energy to figuring out how, how we're going to make a bloody fortune in green energy. Well, even like... Uh... And I guess, you know, like just for everyone who, who doesn't know, how long have we known each other? Like a year probably now? Yeah, around um, a year. I've definitely put a significant sum and people very close to me put a significant sum um, just in the deals with Daryl and buying them. You know, he's, he represents us. But it's crazy how much he's really expanded my horizons in real estate and just really gets you to think big. And it, I actually find it funny sometimes, and I've never told you this till now, but I'll uh I'll call Daryl, and uh, I hope that's not loud. And I don't know what he's doing in my house, but anyways, uh, I'll call him, and he's like, "Hey, hey, hey, can I call you back?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And he's like, "Cool, we're just closing. I got some guys out of Saudi. They're here. We're buying this hundred million dollar building right now." I'm like, 
yeah, I get it, bro. You're busy. Okay, cool. Call me when you're done. And he, he does all this stuff all the time. And it's been kind of surreal because I haven't met too many people like that who are operating on that level day to day. And so it, all the stuff I've learned from him, it's, it really expands your horizon what's possible. And like one of the biggest things I've learned is one, what a, a fucking real good broker can do for you. Not all brokers are created equally. And I think, and you may disagree with this, but I think one thing that sets you apart is one, how you understand value. I think you understand value to a different degree that most people have no idea. I think they try to commoditize real estate when real estate's not really a commodity game. Right. And then two, just the creative value adds that exist. Before we hopped on this podcast, because Gabe and Daryl hadn't met, but Daryl will tell me this shit all the time, man. He's like, so he has he has a fair bit of property in Texas and you guys kind of have more or less a ranch, right? Right, right. And uh, his neighbor has a, a significant ranch. Are you able to talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. This, yeah, so, this, this, no names, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so think someone has thousands of acres. It's, you know, it's not like a downtown city. Like it's probably not super expensive land. It's basically a giant forest. With right. some foods, right? It's so, cattle land, rice land. Yeah. It's yeah, it's ag agriculture. Agriculture. Yeah. And it's spot on. Yeah. So I think this is brilliant. And again, this wouldn't have even been on my horizon if it's not talking to guys like Daryl who eat and like live this shit day and day, day in, day out. Could you kind of talk about the deal that they just signed on this land? Yeah, and it and it goes back to 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 green energy and and, and really understanding green energy and and the scalability of green energy. I don't know if I, I told you, um, um, we're, we're working on the largest green energy portfolio for office in the country in Dallas. We saw oh. a track of land. It's going to be a million square feet, all timber. And with the, uh, this shit doesn't surprise me, Daryl. <laughs> so, yeah, it was cool. So <laughs> you know, we've gone from zero to, to supersonic on green energy, and it really starts with green energy and and regardless of where you what you think of it, it's not going away. Um, we're probably 15 years behind Europe and the rest of the world, or the majority of of the world that are embracing green energy. And so, when you look at green energy, and one of my first statements to uh, Jessica is on my team, like, how are we going to? Again, I think I said this, maybe I didn't. How are we going to make money in green energy? And about two weeks later, I said. We're going to nail up green energy. We're going to make a lot of money in this business because that's where everything's growing to. So when you have green energy and you can scale it, that's the key. If you can scale it and get to a higher number. So like for a power plant, you know, you can pay off a, a you know, half billion dollar power plant probably three years, four years with the carbon credits. And so to fully understand, it's like, well, what is a carbon credit? A lot of, probably the majority of you guys know what the, the carbon credit is, but a carbon credit is you have a dirty facility and a clean facility. So the dirty facility still wants to continue to operate, but they basically have to have pay penalties to buy these carbon credits to allow it to still be operating as, a, as, a, as an older facility. But we have this brand new facility that's capturing all the carbon. Then we can take that and produce the energy, uh, monetize the energy on the grid and get carbon credits because we're clean. And so you, so. You know, it, it, when you, you know what's it, funny about that? You're creating right. your own currency. It, it, exactly. That's, that's exactly what you're doing. It's uh, right now, it's uh, the carbon credit market is still uh, it, in the early pioneering year it, um, stages of, of carbon credits. It's a, it's a $2 trillion market right now. In comparison, the um, um, crypto market, uh, specifically Bitcoin, is. It was at 60,000, it was a trillion. So, you know, call it, it was at 30 now. So, call it half, half trillion. Well, the carbon credit market is right now two trillion. It's growing to $30 trillion. Growth is going to be enormous. And so, so you start having these huge producers of energy and, and carbon having to look for these credits and, the, and the other ways to sequester uh, emissions. And so, I started to read some things about um, some of the ways to take dirty air is to pump it down into the earth, earth uh, and below the surface and sequestering that in these these basically cavities that they create. And again, this is my green energy, green education is well, you know, it's a lesson with TD and I know each other for like eight months. Yeah. Um, and um, it just it's going to change our life. It'll change my income stream and the way and the deals we go into. 
and where to advise my clients to go into. I could talk for another three hours on that, but, but yeah, so I'm just studying this. And, and so, um, um, it was right at the, right there at, 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 at Christmas and New Year's and, um, and I was across the street at uh, this uh, really neat family, and they've had tons and tons of land in the, since the early 1900s, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of acres. And it was kind of funny. I, I, I just started reading about this, about this uh, sequestering, and we have some, too, that I'm looking at in early and I'm near that big. And I thought, I thought, I wonder if he, he's heard anything about this. And so I said, hey, have you heard about where they, they're taking this carbon and piping it? Through pipelines and put it underground, and he goes, "Dude, we've been negotiating with the you know ABC, India, uh, uh, oil and gas, and everybody knows to do just that." And yeah, the, the, the name of the company is not ABC, obviously. He just like doesn't want to reveal what it is for yeah, exactly. personal. But this uh, this blew my mind. Keep going though. Yeah, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got land that you know everything. Great thing about land is you know they're not God's not producing any more of it, right? But, you know, land can be a liability because if, if it's not income producing, you still have to pay the taxes and keep them, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you get to agricultural land, you know, you're trying to monetize the value of the land. If you don't have oil and gas, it, and, and a lot of people don't realize you have surface rights and mineral rights. And a lot of times mineral rights are, 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 are never sold. So less and less people have mineral rights. So if you have a bunch of agricultural land, if you have the minerals and you're in a good area, then you can monetize that. But otherwise, you, you know, you just get cattle and, and crops and things like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's not a highly lucrative business unless you really scale it. But it can be, you know, keeping up with the changes in commodities and taxes and costs. It, it becomes a real liability. Well, all of a sudden, this deal comes in and it literally makes the value of the, the whole value of the land worth what they're paying you on a yearly basis. So if I just said, Hey, I want to sell 40,000 acres and here's the market price pre that this deal would give you that every year or have a long contract. So you know, would, without going num into numbers, would you say an eight figure deal, a nine figure deal? What would you say? Oh yeah. Nine figure deal. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Agricultural land, bare fucking land. Part yeah. of my yeah. Nine figure deal. Yeah. So yeah. It's like this where it's like so much money can be made out of an asset that you just literally had no idea. No, exactly. And, and it takes me back to real estate is an illiquid asset. And so what that means is it doesn't trade quickly. Like if you look at the stock market and the, and the reason why you can, you can know exactly what a stock is worth is because you know, it's trading hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, a million times a day. So the, the value is constantly being verified. Where real estate is an illiquid asset, so it's not like you're having a building trade a hundred times over in a year. You know, trades once every three to five years. And so, where where the uh, advantage comes in is when you can buy assets and leverage the value that's not realized in the marketplace yet. Mm -hmm. So you can go and buy the asset, and you can see the potential to take it to another level, and you know, however you put that together. That's why real estate is one of the best investments. It's, you know, known to man, beginning of time is one of the you know, areas that people really, truly create generational wealth. And you can do it. I mean, even if you're just making, you know, under $100,000 a year, it's, you got to have the vision. You got to bring something to the table. You go out and you collect like minds or investors and just start buying it. If it's as simple as just doing what I did with the houses, you know, with my wife and I just on the side, then I've been blessed to have a seat at the table to sit back and look at Tyler's of the world, Gabriel's of the world, and, and some of these big investors and how they invest their money and, and how, they, how they turn their money. Um, you know, a lot of times people look at, okay, what's your internal rate of return? Internal rate of return, it's what you pay for the property, it's your cash flow, and it's your residual value. And that's combined into a IRR over the whole period. So when somebody says, now I got a 20% return, you held it for three years, that means you made 20% for those three years of return on your investment. And so, or if it, a lot of times people look at, okay, what's my multiple? I invest a million dollars and I'm like, no matter how long I, I hold the property, I sell it, whatever, what am I, excuse me, to make it two or three or four or five multiples. And that's a real simplistic way of looking at, at returns. But one thing I learned four years of finance at Texas a and University and great finance career, um, department, uh, business department, 
is a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. I mean, that's the basis of, of investing because you, if you can take a dollar today, like, like TD was saying earlier, he taking his cash flow out of his company and putting it into real estate, it's a multiple. And so now you're enhancing your, your money and putting how much you leverage on it. That money today is working more than it would have been if it was just sitting in the asset. So, you know, depending on what the returns are, sometimes it's better to take your money out, take the money today, put it into a higher yielding asset. Mm -hmm. And then that's where my business gets to, well, what property makes the biggest returns? And I could, I could teach a course on that. And we've done you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars of transactions. So you get a seat at the table. And, and a lot of times I sell properties three times. Like I've sold office buildings for some of my wealthy multimillionaire billionaires three different times. And you're constantly evaluating deals. And then it was back to what my dad taught me. If you know money, you can do anything. And so that's when I've, I've got, I guess, so, you know, we've got so many listings that people always, if you're coming to invest, you get somebody's going to call me because I'm, my name's going to pop up somewhere on a listing and mm -hmm. I'm sold or doing. And then, and then you get to where, like when somebody calls me and they say, well, tell me about this property and, and, and how much is it, how, what are you asking? How much is it worth? And, and, um, and, you know, do you have a beds, you know, when the beds do, et cetera, et cetera. I don't even go there. If I don't know him already, I say, I say if you don't want me asking, who am I talking to again? And, and then I'll say, what company are you with? And then, are you, are you an investor? Are you a broker? And they're like, oh, no, we're, we're an investor. And the next question is, well, uh, do you own any property? Do you own any office? Do you own any infrastructure? What, what's the name of the company? What's the website? And all of a sudden, I've switched it to where now I'm doing what you all do with re recording data, but I'm doing it in a way that instead of, like when, when you just start off in this business, you just cold call. Well, cold call does nothing. Cold call does nothing for me because I'm in the game and I've got all these assets. And so all these people are calling me. So I have all these registered active, most likely people who are going to execute deals. And so I have the, you know, the, the, the most prime list of, of people wanting to put out money. And so rather than just going in and selling one property, I want to know that person so I can understand, you know, okay, Gabriel, what, you know, what do you want to invest? What is your family looking to do? What are your goals? You know, you know, and all of a sudden now I know Gabriel is X, Y, Z. And when I have something call come up or I'm putting a deal together, I know the way Gabriel thinks, I'm like, oh, this is perfect for Gabriel. And then people are like, well, how in the hell did you sell that? Or how in the hell did you meet this guy? Or how in the hell did you sell this power plant when you've never sold a power plant before? And it's, it, it goes back to understanding the capital stack, understanding who to take it to and how to market it with technology and the internet and drone videos and the team that puts all this together and and I can sit there. And out. the value, man. The yeah, underlying exactly. value. And you go. One of the things, the biggest things I think I learned from you, man, that one case study that really caught my attention was uh, a client uh, that you mentioned where yeah. they'd bought a piece of property. It was, a, it was an industrial piece of property. I think it was just blank land, right? It, it had a, a, a deep water port and rail on it. Gotcha. Uh, so it had a couple assets, and that's very important to know. Yeah. Um, because those assets is what basically attracted people to that property. Could you kind of like talk through that case study a little bit? I know obviously yeah. you can't get specifics, but just so yeah. people, because I really want people to understand, like one, I want them to understand how this shit actually works, at least conceptually, so yeah. they can see how important it is for a value add and to understand certain assets. And two, I want it to be tangible for people, which I think probably haven't done it great. Like, you know, we've been talking kind of like high level on stuff. And so I, I'm sure someone's like, oh man, I got a million bucks for 2 million bucks. Like you don't realize how far you could actually get with that. But uh, yeah, if you want to talk about that example, and then I'd love to figure yeah. out how to get tangible for people too. Yeah, absolutely. And it, this was an asset that um, it, it was a brownfield asset and brownfield, like you have a brown, when you get to industrial manufacturing and infrastructure, you have brownfield, you have greenfield. And, and, and so brownfield means that it is, something's already been developed. The property has been developed. And it can mean it, it, it might have environmental problems or it, it doesn't, but it's got infrastructure that's already there. Whereas a greenfield is a, a, just a brand new new canvas. And so it doesn't have anything on it. And so some of these brownfield assets have really high value 
because rail is very expensive to put in. Pipelines coming into the property are very expensive. Building a deep water port on the property is very expensive. And then you get to the point where the Corps of Engineers might not even approve those infrastructure assets today. So then they become even more valuable. It's like having a, you know, a, a, a high rise on you know, Park Avenue. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, it's hard to replicate those kind of, that kind of value and that asset quality. And so this was one of our infrastructure assets and, and uh, I'll round the numbers. So people want to be thankful with Dale I'm talking about. If anybody sees this, that, that is around kind of me, but it's, uh, you know, they bought it for 50 million and within a plus or minus a year, they turned that 50 million to 125 million um, because they, they started to subdivide out the property and, and do a lease here and do a lease there. And then they just monetize the whole thing um, for call it 225 million. And, and so you're talking about a hundred to 225 left in less than a year and a half, two years. Now, everybody's like, sign me up. I want to do one of those. I can't deliver that all the time. But when I say you need to do this, those are the kind of deals. I'm like, you just need to do this. But those kind of assets, if they're very, I'll go back to saying how, how real estate is an illiquid asset. It, it, it's also hard to find, right? So you just can't call up your stockbroker and say, hey, I just heard about these infrastructure assets. I, you know, can, you go, can you go hit me up with one of those? And you know, I want to go make you know, 200 million and 150 million in 18 months. It's, that's what gives groups and, and individuals like myself more and more value and, and, and momentum because now I can go, I always say I'm in the control tower. I get to see the plans lay, land and leave. I see six months ahead because I'm always talking to guys like you and and and, and bankers and investors and loan groups and, and insurance companies. And I can see when they cut off the ticket. I'll know the day they say we're not going to do any more loans this year, but the rest of the market won't know that for three, three months, six months. Um, and so I get to see all the stuff in advance. So to even find these assets, you really got to be creative. And, and, and get in the back door or, or list the properties. The key to my business is listing properties and finding those opportunities. But yeah, to, to being able to monetize that type of asset. When you get into that though, you're sitting with a million dollars, go find, go find a group of people to invest with or collect. Totally. Dude, even, even like a quarter million, man, you right. get a there few people together. Like there's one small deal we're doing in Florida here. We partnered with the builder. The reason we partnered with the builder is because I don't know how to build shit. Yeah. So clearly I'm not the one to build this, yeah. but like the, we, there's a house in West shore and here's, here's the basic numbers. Um, the house was half a million bucks. So we bought the house, a uh, small group of us, me and Romano and the builder. So we bought this house. It is zoned for townhouses. So half a million bucks because the builder has such a good track record with the bank. The bank will give us a construction mortgage, 100% finance, no money down. Yeah. So now we're out half a million and we're going to get 1.6 to build this thing. Mind you, cost of building has dropped since we initially put this together. So that's right. been a favor. When the time these things are done, so basically we're building four townhouses. Well, the builder is. So we built four townhouses. The value he estimates will be about 3.4 million. You wow. refinance those 70% loan to value after you stabilize them. You pay off your construction mortgage, you get all your initial capital back, and you just right. reuse that shit. Yeah. You can get all your money out and reuse it for another deal, and you still own three and a half million dollars, whatever it is of real estate, with a million dollars of equity that you've literally built in there almost out of thin air because now all your money's out. And yeah. then you have tax advantages and ongoing reoccurring income with that. Yeah. It's like a, it's a steal. Yeah. But it comes yeah. to what Daryl's saying, you find these opportunities by you know, talking to people who are actually doing these, we, the, the builder presented this to us. It was someone Romano knew and we popped up on the boat with him one day. He was talking about how he had this property. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He wanted to build it, but his partner wasn't into it. And we're like, well, what if we buy your partner out? And he's like, game on. Yeah. And so it's like, it's just be, like you said, be in the game, be around the right people and the opportunities and look for value add deals. Because when you can find value add deals, that's where you're going to make the lift. I think uh, you're 100% you're correct. And I think we're on the doorstep is probably, even though I said that we're, we're going to go into challenging times with higher interest rates, we're on the doorstep of probably the best opportunity in our lifetime to invest in commercial real estate. If you can find the secret 
the secret sauce. Did you think commercial? Yes, 100%. Yeah. And, and residential too, but more so with commercial. Um, and, 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 and values are changing so drastically because the cost of capital is quadrupled. So all these, all these properties that are coming to maturity, you know, and they, and their current rate is two and a quarter, 3%. And all of a sudden you go to your bank and, and they say, oh, well, you know, to renew this loan is going to be eight and a half, nine percent because prime's eight. And so when you go to a traditional bank, you know, bank financing house, nine percent, eight and a half percent. And so you're going to be underwater. And so, a huge um, jump. oh yeah. yeah. And so if you can control the money, I'll never forget. I was in a, in a um, symposium and we were down in South Florida playing golf and, and it was all these top um, uh, leaders of uh, big insurance companies that read some things and we're having talks. And this was 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And we're talking about interest rates and where they're headed. And one of the CEOs said, I like a high interest rate market. And I sat back and I was just looking at him like, what the hell are you saying? I'm mean, that you know, if you're a CEO, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I finally understood why he said that. Because when, when interest rates are high, if you have liquidity, then your competition goes down. Mm -hmm. So, right, it's just supply and demand. So now you don't have as many buyers that can go buy this property and the value is going to change. The value is going to go down. And so mm -hmm. it, it keeps the novices out of the game. When I was traveling to Dubai, it finally dawned on me because my goal was to go over there and find the lowest cost of capital. And of course, if you have oil and gas money, that's your, on the, on the, so the scale of cost of capital, that's the lowest cap cost of capital that you can get. And um, before you go into the dark world, right? And, and, yeah, yeah. And, but if you, you know, legitimate lowest cost of capital, uh, it was oil and gas money. And I got over there and I realized when I went back to the States, you can go down to the corner bank and get a two and a half percent loan. So now you've got these new startups competing with these big companies chasing assets. And that's why you had that great increase in pricing. And so right now, all that pricing is going to be adjusted and you can go pick up these assets if you have liquidity. And it's a, it's a bullet to the temple. I hate to use, be that graphic. A lot of times everybody says, like, oh, that's, that's a kill shot, right? They, you know, you've got to figure out the liquidity side. Because if you think you can go to borrow with the money, the borrowers now, these deals aren't financeable because you're not going to cover your debt coverage ratio and your interest rates are so high in the return you're getting. So if your interest rate is 8%, but you're only making a 6% return on the property, you're underwater. A deal doesn't pencil out. And so if you have liquidity and you can come in and say, I'll close in 30 days, I'll pay, I'll, I'll pay all cash, I'll just need to get a you know, claim report, then we're ready to go. You, you pick up a tremendous amount of value at the front because you have low cost of capital, you have liquidity. That's going to be the key, in, in, whether you're taking your $100,000 or your $100 million, is, is the ability to go in this and have the liquidity to buy the properties. And, and the person who figures out how to raise liquidity and raise cash is going to be picking out which golf stream they want to buy. Is it the four series, the five series, the six or seven? No. I think it's 750 now, you would know, Tyler, that I don't think the 850s come out, but the 750. Oh, man, I, I'm still brushing up on my jets, man. <laughs> it's like 70 billion. But you figure out that equation, you figure out a way to go raise money quickly on the internet and then pull it together and go buy assets and then buy assets. You know, you don't have to send it all to me. You, I mean, you could just go to smart people that have the ability to find value. Yeah. That's where the fortunes are going to be made in this period. It's not going to be, oh, what's going to happen if this person is elected president or that person is elected president, or I got to wait for rates to come down. No, the time to go is now. Go yeah. figure it out. Another favorite saying I was taught to my father was, I don't make the rules, learn how to play the game. And mm -hmm. so just, just go figure it out. Yeah, but then it, it's... It, it, Even it's, with like 50, 100 grand, you get a couple of guys together... Now yeah. everyone's diverse their risk. Everyone's in it together. It's yeah. like, it's crazy what you can pull off. The, the liquidity and pick your asset, whether it's, you know, I, I don't know why I'm coming up with this, but, you know, buying somebody's Ferrari that has to get rid of it right now. Yeah. You can get three guys together, but, you know, whatever, and you buy it for 300 and turn around and sell it for 400 within a week. You know what, man? So I, I was mentioning, uh, yeah, perfect example. But even so, um, subject to, 
So I met a guy on Wednesday and he was, I forget what business he was in. Um, and he just kind of did it, I think, to kind of like, I hope he doesn't hear this, to stay out of his wife's hair, I think. Yeah. <laughs> he had a business and they flipped 50 properties. And he's like, he's like, I love it. He's like, we'll make 100 to 150 grand in less than 30 days. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, are you rolling a lot of cash? And he's, he starts laughing. He's like, he's like, last year we did 50 deals. He's like, 45 of them I did subject to. And I'm said, what the hell is that? And he's like, you take over the mortgage. He's like, it's costing yeah. me $2,000 yeah. to take over these properties. Yeah. And in three days, he needs rental money, obviously, which he could probably pull from a line or yeah. whatever, yeah. or yeah. find a yeah. partner. But he's buying these properties. He's getting them under control for two grand. He's renovating them. In less yeah. than 30 days, he's making 100, 150 grand. Yeah. Yeah. It's about crazy. creativity. It's about adding value and finding the opportunities. You nailed it, uh, Hitty. And, and, and you know how he yeah. finds these listings, advertising online. Oh, wow. That's wow. how they generate leads. Amazing. It's back to the internet in the olive world. Yeah. Yeah. And it, everyone listening to this podcast, I'm sure half of them have ran some ad online. And, and the, these guys are not sophisticated. Like for guys who listen to this, who know actually how to run ads, and you know what I mean by run ads, like you would literally probably wipe the floor with these guys. It's just like an older right. guy, his wife, and they run some Facebook ads, they get some leads. And they're, you know, they're making millions a year, $2,000 at a time. That's crazy. Wild. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a game of probabilities. If you can increase your probability, then, then you just, you just replicate it, right? Yeah. So you have a high success of winning and you, you get this, this perfect box to, to go, go after. And then you just, you just replicate it. You, you know, the other thing, and we haven't touched on this yet, but like from a tax perspective, mm -hmm. real estate is like the best wealth building tool ever. One one hundred percent, and 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 there's so many different ways you can take of it with cost segregation while you own the property, and or then financing out know, to get your cash out. Exactly. There is exactly. um. Go ahead. Well, you know, um, when you refinance, um, uh, and historically we have the low interest rates been great because when you refinance, um, you're not subject to to um, taxes because you haven't sold the property, right? So. You bought the property for 10, it goes to 20, you refinance for 17,500,000. Well, that 7,500,000 now of appreciation or return you may have your basis is tax free because you haven't sold it. And so that's why, you know, low interest rates really, you can. And guess what? In five years, now it's 25 million. You refinance yeah. and pull another couple million tax free. Exactly. Right. And who pays that? The tenant. Like, right. I get so fired up about real estate because I'm like, I wish people had a better understanding of the opportunity and whether it's, you know, you're doing billion dollar deals with Daryl or you're doing like $2,000 flips as you go, like the, the, the opportunity is there for everybody. Absolutely. And, and believe me, going back to my numbers game, we, we have, I'll get my spreadsheet up here. We've got assets that are $6 million, $7 million. Um, and we just pop those. I mean, you know, it's just like baseball. You, you need those little base hits and, I want that. I, I can, I've come from the days of uh, aluminum bats, which is like ping, ping, ping. You, know, you want those deals popping. Um, and what's interesting too is if you can figure out the asset classes to go after. So we've, and again, sold you know, 245 office buildings the last 20 years. Um, I could write a book on office buildings and understanding the value of office buildings. And, and the world changed when COVID came in. And this technology that is that we all are embraced has changed the way we work, live, and, and circulate. And it's going to continue to accelerate as green energy and electrical cars. And if you haven't learned about this, Google 15 minute cities to where people are going to be in walking distance of living, working, and playing. And, and so it's going to affect some of these uses. So, like for, for most of America right now, the office vacancy on these office buildings. Right, 25%. And I, I think it's going to be permanent to a certain degree where certain properties used to always be 100%. They'll never be 100% again. They're going to be 70%, 80%. And that's going to be perceived as stabilization. So the guy uh, who you know, who I met Wednesday at this conference too, he said 70% is the new 100. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, yeah. And then, so then you get to the point of, you start looking at some of these buildings that are 20, 30% um, occupied, they're older, 
Um, and half of Houston, Houston's got roughly 235 million square feet of office space. Texas has a billion three. So let's just look at Houston. Of that 235 million, half of Houston was built in the early 80s because of tax advantages and things. And so you have all these not eroding assets that have aged that need a lot of capital to go back into them. And so the with the issues with office building sometimes is you have to retenant every six months, every six week, oh, three years, five years, a year. You have to retenant the space. You have to rebuild it. If you can find a model in, a, in an office building that you don't have to keep replicating the space and you can keep it more like an apartment to where you don't have to re move the walls, change the plumbings and start doing things like that, then that's how you become more profitable in the office. But also the next game, TD, and I don't know if I've talked to you about this yet, but we're getting very close to doing the largest vertical growth farm in North America in one of our buildings since 1.3 million square feet. Or sure, Dara. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so all the time, dude. Like it's, it, it, it's like someone's highlight career is like Daryl's fucking Tuesday. <laughs> but, no, but, but we, we, we love it because we, you know, just, I'm at the plate a lot. So, right. You get a chance to do all this stuff and, and get creative. And so I think you're going to start when you're looking at investments and you're looking at $2 million office buildings that are, I got one right now. I said 6 million. I've got a deal we would sell for probably 3 million. And so uh, it's 30 bucks a foot. It's, uh, it's three stories. It's 100,000 square feet. It's 20% occupied. I think you're going to see some of these buildings convert to um, commercial storage, uh, maybe even a smaller one, residential storage, uh, but mainly more beer commercial storage, maybe big server facilities where nothing but hardware is in there for the cloud if it has a lot of power to it and, and uh, can't find uh, lines. But also, I think you're going to see these indoor grow farms. And, and what's interesting about these indoor grow farms is this, the, the scale is 50 to 1. So if you have if you have um, a thousand, and you have uh, just you, um, an office building has 1.3 million square feet becomes 50 million square feet because it's 50 to 1. And so it, it'd be you know, thousands of acres that you're doing within this office building. And then... And what's interesting is, it, it, I'm sure some of you guys have gotten into LED lighting and understand LMD, LED lighting. I, I really realized this from all the buildings we got in. And we've got fluorescent lights in here because we didn't get high, enough high TI dollars to get the LED five years ago. But, you know, we're we'll negotiating that, Lee Sterile. I just do invest in sales, right? Now, do some <laughs> um, fluorescent lights, they, it's on off, on off, on off. And so, it's just, you know, our eyes don't see it, but it just flickers 50 times a second. What LED is the closest thing to sunlight that there is. And so they're finding, and one of my guys that owns the LED company and, and made one of his buildings into a grow farm, a miniature grow farm. So that's how I got ahead of this five, 10 years ago. But LED lights, it's constant sun. So what they've learned is they can put these crops in under LED lights and you can turn the crop five times over a normal outside. Um, um, grow pattern because of uh, you know night day night day where this one's just solid light and it's it's organic and and you don't have to put all the pesticides so it's huge carbon credits is back to the this is what makes Daryl good is understanding the assets mm -hmm. Thank you. man like well, how cool. would you even know about that you know yeah. what I mean it's crazy well and it, and it's just funny because. With, what I love about this business, it allows you to meet so many great individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you, and it was great and needed to become the best of friends with so many people around the world just through real estate. And, yeah. and you get to know, but you also get to know their business and their business model and how they make money. And that's what I really love sitting back and observing uh, you guys and how you're, you're forging ahead in the, in, in the internet and advertising. It's fascinating. And so, yeah, you just pick this up. It's crazy. I, we, I and I, I don't, just because I know we don't have the time, but like if anyone gets the time to pick Daryl's brain on crypto and like, I, you know, he introduced us to a group in, um, I'll, I'll do keep this high level quick because I know, yeah, yeah. Them, but he introduced us to a group in Texas. Uh, I won't mention their names, but they had, you know, what was it? 400 megawatt yeah. uh, crypto facility crypto mining off and yeah. What they were telling us was how they're taking advantage of basically they call it power arbitrage. And so what happens in Texas is that the the cost of power will spike. And so say normally it's at five cents, the times will spike to 50 cents. 
well, in order to meet the demand or not to meet the demand, the price spikes because there is demand. And so what happens is power plants will gear up to, you know, take advantage of the pricing and all that stuff, but it takes them a period of time. Well, really smart crypto miners in, you know, fraction of a second will divert their power to the, you know, sell it at a premium as opposed to mine crypto. And these guys were making, you know, millions extra a week in 15 minute increments per week. Yeah, as a byproduct of their business. And, and one of my really sharp, sharp, smart power brokers taught this to us. And it, it's just power arbitrage. And so it's you mine and, and make money in crypto. And then when the grid needs the power, this is why crypto, Texas will become the crypto mining capital of the world because of this. Um, and everybody doesn't, they don't really understand it because they like to be, you know, the bad guy in the, in the papers. Um, it's actually the best thing for the grid. Because the grid's going to need power. Well, nobody, you can shut off 400 megawatts of power in, in a quarter of a second, and the grid gets it instantaneous. And so it's, it's hard to have that big of a power source to be able to turn off their power and give it back to the grid when they need it. And then you make the, the multiple is insane. One of our guys. Also, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. One of our guys had a um, Petro power plant. And I didn't know anything about power. 12 months ago, like I do now. I mean, you know, so, right. I mean, you just, it's a whole another thing. And not to digress, but keep this in mind, real estate, and I'm literally just saying this for the first time or trying to, trying to put it out there for people to understand. Real estate is the basis for everything because it's, everything is attached to some type of real estate. And so if you can see all these different avenues, of, you're almost like you're in the matrix and it leads back to real estate, right? I don't think I've ever put it like that, but that's how... And so I get to see all these different lines of income. And yeah. so when our buddies, they built a Pico power plant. So a Pico power plant is basically just a release pitcher. When it needs to come in, they call them out of the bullpen, right? So when the power is needed, they just crank up that Pico power center. So these guys built the, the Pico power plant, cost them $75 million, paid it off in three days. They opened it up. The freeze happened in Texas, paid it off in three days. And so- $5 million in three days. Three days paid for it. And, and, and you got to realize that's reoccurring. That's what you got to realize on the carbon credits. Once you get back your payback, you're still getting the carbon credits that are reoccurring on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So everything you look at, and if you can scale it either better, you got to think, how is this going to be changed by green energy? And how can I provide a product that is going to be competitive in green energy? Because what TD and I were saying that the new stabilization is 70%. Well, that's on old assets. On new assets, I'm about to bring the first million square feet of, uh, in one location, which uh, I told the developer, I said, this will be a, a corporate 100 campus for somebody. They'll buy it like that. I said, I'll, I'll get five people competing for it because nobody is in a million square feet of the biggest green office building in the country. And they do it with it's this timber that they compress and the whole building is wood. And it's also fireproof because when it's compressed like that, it, uh, it doesn't combust at a certain point. And, but anyway, attaching to those different types of assets on how to monetize it. But the energy giving is it's like, well, how? I was, I was giving this a case study to some, some young kids that had come in and we had some of the brokers around. And one of the real estate brokers said, what the hell do you do here, Daryl? Meaning like, why are you talking about power arbitrage? And how does that have to do with the real estate? Well, it has everything to do with real estate. Because if you if you have a if you have an ability to provide power or your battery storage, just all this green energy is just going to throw off all this new stuff that is going to be like how why did I think about that or how the hell did you find that? It was you know having talks like this, and so you know when my mind starts going like the Matrix, I love it. It, <laughs> it, it yeah. all it all goes back to the core is the real estate, right? And I'm, I'm just in the middle of town town square and everybody's coming around and I'm just keeping my mouth shut and listening and seeing where things are happening around smart people. I love it, man. Well, we better wrap this up. I'd be really curious. So real estate has been like a definitely, I've always had some sort of real estate for a while now, but if you guys like hearing about real estate, obviously if you can't tell, it's been a passion of mine. I get to learn from great people like Daryl. Um, if it's something you guys want to know more about, we can definitely have obviously more interviews with, you know, probably with Daryl and then just other people he could recommend. Let us know. Give us some feedback. But uh, regardless, Daryl, um, if anyone wants to contact you, uh, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, uh, Daryl.bets at davisandyoung.com. 
D A O R R E L L dot bets, B as a boy, E T T S, Avison, A V I S O N, Yon, Y O U N G dot com. I think everything's going to get is people's cell phones. I don't even give my office phone anymore. And number eight just rolls from the cell. But my direct line is 713 515 5001. And I don't sleep. So you call me 24 <laughs> 7. I'll test it. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I thanks for everyone it. to listen today. For everyone watching, please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube. And for everyone listening, please give us a five star review on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. We got it all. All right. Thanks again, man. That was really entertaining. That was cool. That was like eye opening for me, start to finish. So, so <laughs> happy to have you. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome, thanks guys. for the opportunity, guys. Be safe. Later. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.